Okay, should we start? I see no English speaking students here as of today, but uh, as long as we have started this journey in English, I think we must continue it. Okay. So, um, the topic of today is to look at this uh, first set of exercises, and it contained three exercises. So, let's start with the first one. Uh, it says here that the first uh, uh, three exercises, one, one, two, one, three, which of course is the, the three ones we'll look at today, uh, contain general game theoretic challenges and could be considered a test of the reader's necessary prerequisites in the subject. So this is kind of just game theory, okay? No, no football or sports here. So uh, this is just plain, simple game theory. So in the first exercise, uh, there are two players playing a simultaneous game and they can choose between two possible strategies both from the same strategist strategy space named S1 and S2 so here <coughs> we have already defined a lot about this game haven't we there is a player 1 and there is a player 2 and they have two possible strategies, is each of them, and we can call them S1 and S2, and they are the same for both of the players. That's kind of the informational content in the first part. And it's also a simultaneous game, and then we typically use this table form to, to look at the game. If both players choose the same strategy, both will achieve payoff A. Okay. So, in this one, then they both choose the same strategy, and in this one, they both choose the same strategy, they each get payoff A. So we can just fill in A immediately here. If they choose different strategies, they receive payoff B. Okay, this corner, player 1 chooses S2, player 1, uh, player 2 chooses S1, and this square, player 1 chooses S1, player 2 S2, has the characteristics that they choose different strategies. And in that case, the payoff should be B. So this is uh, uh, the table form of the game, which is described in this exercise. And then it says here, construct a game matrix, it's often referred to as a normal or strategic forming game theory, by the way, which we haven't discussed, uh, reflecting the information about. This is the answer to question A, okay? So then uh, we have answered that one. Then let's move to B. And now we make an assumption. We assume that B is larger than A. Okay? That gives us information on how to find these best rep reply functions. That's the reason why this information is given. And, and uh, we are asked here to find all Nash equilibria in the game. So let's do that. Now we know that we should maximize in the columns. Initially we didn't know whether A was larger or smaller than B, but now we know that B is larger than A. In that case, we should put a circle around B compared to A. The same here, B is larger than A, the same here. B is larger than A, the same here, B is larger than A. So based on this analysis, we can see immediately that there are two Nash equilibria in pure strategies here. Two Nash equilibria in pure strategies. This one and this one. And this is what we kind of refer to as a chicken type of game, okay? Where you you don't know what they do, but you know know that they don't do the same thing. Okay. So this one, player one chooses his second strategy, while player two chooses his first strategy. This one, the opposite way around. So this is a kind of chicken game, as we have called it. We also discussed when we dis discussed this chicken game briefly, that it typically has three Nash equilibria. There are two in pure strategies and one in mixed strategies. So there is another underlying Nash equilibria here, so basically it's 
there is actually plus one more in mixed strategies. I also said that we don't pretend as a part of this course you cannot learn the technique on how to find and demonstrate how these uh, mixed strategy equilibria are found. I also said that in the textbooks there is some appendices that kind of goes through the mechanism. So uh, the point here is really not to go through that. If you look at Fronter now, I put up a solution part, so let's just go in there and have a look. So there is a solution there. Hopefully there is also a solution in the textbook. I'm not sure. Maybe it, it should be. So if you go in here and if you go at the Lösningsforslag means solutions, okay? So it's 300 for the solutions. There is a new file here which uh, contains more or less what's on the blackboard here. So there are two, Hash Equilibrium and Pure Strategies. This is in Norwegian, of course. There is a, an English version in the textbook. Let's just have a look, perhaps. If we go to the end here of the textbook and see if it contains the solution. Yes, it indeed does seems, yeah. So we might as well look at this one then, as it's in English, okay? Mm -hmm. Solutions to, yeah, you see the matrix here? And um, the matrix with the best replies and these two pure Nash equilibria. And then what follows here is the kind of technique we really didn't go into, okay? You, you just have to construct this expected payoff, which we briefly discussed how to do by kind of looking at each of the pairs in this, this first equation, E1. We start by looking at pair 1, and he can either get an A here, a B here, an a, a B there, and an A there. And for each of these four outcomes, we have to construct a probability so we have to introduce a PQ kind of distribution. So if this has P and this has 1 minus P and this has Q and this has 1 minus Q, we can immediately see that the probability of this outcome would be P times Q. Probability of this final one would be 1 minus P times 1 minus Q. And by, by multiplying and adding together, together, we get this expression here, just to just to just inform you, okay? Even though you're, you're kind of not expected to be able to perform this. And then we have to do something which is often referred to as taking partial derivatives. I don't know whether you know that. It's a certain technique that kind of finds a derivative of a function with, with more than one variable. So you kind of take derivatives with respect to one variable, keeping everything else constant. In that case, you get an expression which says something about how the thing you look at changes when the variable changes. And what's interesting in this case is actually the sign of this expression. So you see here, you, we form that, we compute it, and then we put it equal to zero to kind of find a value for this Q, and it turns out to be a half, okay? And doing the same for the other player turns out to be another half, so then you end up with this mixed strategy Nash equilibrium, where uh, each of the players should either choose this one or this one with the probability of a half. Okay, that was exercise B. Let me return to the exercise. But was it here? Somewhere along the long lo road here, yeah. No, this was something else. Okay. Any questions? So the idea here is for you more or less to kind of know that in this situation when there are two Nash equilibrium and a two pair game, it should also be a, a third one in mixed strategies. Although you're kind of not expected to be able to perform the derivation or the actual calculation of this third Nash equilibrium and mixed strategies. If you're interested, of course, it's, uh, it's relatively straightforward. And uh, there is a better, a better uh, recipe, so to speak, in the in another appendix in the in the textbook. Okay, let's move to 
sub question C. Assume now that B is less than A. So we kind of reverse this assumption in C. We kind of turn this inequality around. So in C, we make another assumption. And now we say that B is smaller than A. So A is now the bigger number. Of course, that turns this argument around. Maybe we should put up some light here. Yeah. Now oh, we have the same letters as we had. But now A is the bigger number, so now this circle moves from that point to that point down here, that way, and that way. So you see that the two Nash equilibrium pure strategies that were kind of residing on this diagonal has now kind of moved over to the other diagonal. Okay, so this is what we kind of briefly discussed, which is often referred to as a stag hunt game or a coordination game. These can be also described as a separation game. You, kind of you separate the solutions. They do different things. Here they kind of do the same. You don't know what they do, but you know that they do the same. So either both players choose S1 as their Nash equilibrium strategy, or both players choose S2 as their Nash equilibrium strategy. And again, the same thing happens here. There is two Nash equilibria in pure strategies. But there is also an added one in mixed strategies. It turns out to be a half a half for the probabilities in this case as well. Compare with question B, we have done that. And we kind of looked at it and see, okay, in this case we get the national equilibra here. Now they suddenly move around. And we've also compared the different structural properties. Here they choose different strategies, either there or there. Here they choose the same strategies, either there or there. So um, this is kind of running through all possible games in a sense, which are the two player, two strategy type. Basically that's kind of what we end up with here. Any questions? Okay, then let's move to sub question E. What happens if A equals B? Yeah, we just uh, make the necessary change then in the matrix and see what happens. Question E. It should be, yeah, it should be E. There's a typo here. That should perhaps be D, shouldn't it? A, B, C. No, it should be D. There's the typo. Okay. So if A equals B, of course, then everything is the same in every route here, isn't it? Every part of everything turns out to have the same letter, either A or B, it doesn't really matter. So here we have a kind of a silly game, don't we? This is not interesting to play, but we still want to analyze it. Okay. So when we want to find the biggest of these two, of course, every one is the biggest. Every one here is the biggest. Every one here is the biggest. Every one here is the biggest. So in this case, we get four Nash equilibria in pure strategies. All of these four sub squares has both a circle and a square within each of the payoffs. So in this case, there are four Nash equilibria in pure strategy. Of course, this basically tells us that we have no idea what will happen here. Okay, so that, that's what it tells us. Okay, the idea of the Nash equilibrium, equilibrium is to give us some idea of how we think the game will end. But in this case, everything can happen. 
That's kind of obvious, isn't it? If you engage in this game, no matter what you do, you get the same. No matter what your opponent do, <coughs> you get the same. Sorry. And uh, in that case, of course, everything will happen. Everything can happen. It's kind of logical. It tells us that this kind of silly game should end like this. But there are more here, isn't it? What about mixed strategies here? What would you think intuitively about mixed strategies, Nash Equilibra here? How many should it be? Is it one? Is it two? Is it ten? Whatever. It doesn't matter what you do here. Okay, so if I play a pure strategy, I get the same. If I play one mixed strategy, I get the same. If I play another mixed strategy, I also get the same. If I play a third mixed strategy, of course I still get the same. So any mixed strategy, P could equal a half, Q could equal a half, or we can, it could be a third, it could be two thirds, whatever, it doesn't really matter. So there, there must be an infinite amount of Nash equilibria in mixed strategies here. So this game has an infinite number of Nash equilibria. Then. Okay, so we can identify that we can find basically as many solutions as we like here by picking any kind of mixed strategy probability. And again, of course, that's logical. Okay, if the game has no point, there is no skill in this game at all. Okay, no matter what you do, the same thing happens. Okay, of course, then you can do whatever you like, including choosing any of the four pure strategy possibilities or any possible combination of mixed strategy probabilities. Okay. Questions? This is not the type of exercises you will be given at the exam. Okay, this is kind of general game theory and it turns out that what we bas basically want to test you in on this course is kind of what's happening in the second part. So this is uh, typically not a candidate for the type of exercises for the exam. This is just to kind of give you a little test on the general game theory part. Okay, then we move to exercise 1-2. It says here, two tabloid newspapers, maybe the term tabloid is a bit tabloid here, it should perhaps be some other term, mm, oh, doesn't matter, two newspapers, paper one and paper two are named here, compete on choice of first page story. We assume that the newspapers can choose between two different stories, which we name A and B. The newspapers have an equal market popularity. So kind of one newspaper is kind of more popular than the other here. That's an assumption we, we kind of stick to here. And we assume that if both choose the same first page story, AA or BB, meaning that they're kind of in a situation where they do the same, paper one receives a market share of alpha. So there's a Greek letter here, alpha. This is typically a number between 0 and 1. This could be, if you multiply it by 100, you get a percent. Okay, so this is kind of the, the market share which each of the papers take if they kind of have the same story. While paper 2 receives 1 minus alpha. So you, if alpha is, let's say, 60%, then of course this would be 40%. So they would kind of get more than as being newspaper 1. The total number of newspapers sold in this market is assumed unaffected by the newspaper's choice of first page story. And that's important because if we kind of have a market which grows or goes down depending on what they choose, then we have to have a much more complex model. So this is kind of, the market size is fixed here. So the readers, they kind of, you don't get any extra readers if you have a certain type of story. <coughs> in A, assume that this alpha lies between a half and one, meaning that it's bigger than a half. Okay, so this newspaper one gets more than 50% of the market. And you just, I just asked here which newspaper would you consider to be the bigger? 
Obviously, that must be newspaper one. Okay, they have a market share which is bigger than 50%. Of course, then they are the bigger paper, based on how we would define the term being big here. Okay. There are many ways of defining bigness of a newspaper. You can count the number of pages, for instance, but that's not the kind of thing we're looking for here. Okay. This is the number of readers. Okay. So the answer to A should be straightforward, just to answer paper one. To some extent, this A was given, as it's tried to be given as some kind of aid here. Okay, so you should immediately understand that the first newspaper is the bigger one here. Assume now, as we move on here, that the first page story in A is really revolutionary. Outbreak of World War Three, or nude MMS pictures of the Prime Minister and the leader of the opposition party in the same bed. Such that if a newspaper has this story alone, it will capture the whole market. A game theory expert has formulated an interpretation of the above story through the game matrix of figure 1-4. And then you're asked in question B to check whether this matrix or table seems reasonable related to the information which is given here as well as up here with this alpha and 1 minus alpha. So this is kind of the input that we construct the matrix. So let's have a look at it. In the start it said here that they were kind of given that they chose the same story, AA or BB, they divided the market amongst them. Okay, Alpha percent if you like to newspaper 1 and 1 minus alpha to newspaper 2. And of course you get alpha 1 minus alpha, alpha 1 minus alpha here as well. This corresponds perfectly with that information. The second piece of information, which was uh, down here, said that if one of these papers, whether it was the bigger or not the bigger, had this revolutionary sto story alone, they would capture the whole market, meaning that they would sell all the papers being sold that day. Of course, then you get a one-zero distribution. Okay, one newspaper gets no readers; the other gets everybody else. That turns out to be one or a hundred percent, and that's exactly what we see in the figure, isn't it? We see here that. If newspaper 1 has story B and newspaper 2 has story A, A is the revolutionary story, then newspaper 2 gets 1, newspaper 1 gets 0 in correspondence with the logic. Move up here, the opposite happens, that is also logic. So the conclusion to this sub question B was it? B is that yes. I find a reasonable correspondence between figure 1-4 uh, and the above story. The game matrix seems reasonable. In most cases, when these kind of exercises are given, unless the exercise maker wants to be nasty, the idea is just to kind of agree with the given text. Okay? But of course, if I am nasty, I might put in a mistake. Of course, then your job is to find that mistake. So you cannot kind of just answer directly. You have to look at it and see, and kind of argue that it seems reasonable. But again, this is not typically the kind of exercise we will meet in the rest of the course. Although this kind of technique, or kind of giving the answer and asking you to comment on it, is something I do from time to time on exams. And the idea is basically to make it simpler it's much diffi more difficult here. You can think I could have formulated this exercise differently, couldn't I? I could have given you all the information here. And then I could have taken out the matrix and I could ask you, construct a game table for this game okay, by yourself. That would be much harder. You see that? Yeah. So there are different ways of formulating the same kind of exercise which very it's a lot in difficulty when it comes to students' response. Of course, in most cases when I make an exam, I try to kind of make have a build-up. I start relatively easy and 
to some extent increase difficulty as we move along. So Jenko, you had uh, an exam with me previously. Was it uh, easy? <laughs> you liked it? Yeah. Okay, that's good. She liked the exam. We will like this one as well. Let's hope so. Okay, then we move to C. Find all Nash equilibri equilibria of the game. Which newspaper gets most readers? Okay. Now this is a bit more tricky. Okay. Suddenly we have taken out all these numbers. Actually, we had some A's and B's here, but we have a very specific on which were bigger. Okay. In this case, we may have to think a little bit. Okay. So let's have a look at the matrix. That's the one we use now to search for Nash equilibria. choose the uh, A case here at top or the B case at bottom and at the right. And then there is an alpha, 1 minus alpha, 1, 0, 0, 1, alpha, 1 minus alpha. As always, when we do this, we try to figure out the best reply functions to look for Nash equilibria. And in this case, if we start as we normally do, by comparing this number and this number, we have to say something about this, don't we? Obviously, this alpha cannot be negative, OK? That's, that's logical, isn't it? Because this is a market share. You cannot have a negative market share. And of course, this alpha, maybe not of course. I would say that it's reasonable to define it as this, as follows. 0, less than alpha, less than 1. Actually, we already know that alpha is larger than 0, don't we? Because in the start of the exercise, we were given that alpha should be bigger than a half. That was given, wasn't it? So alpha is a positive number here, actually bigger than a half. And a half is bigger than 0, isn't it? So we can conclude here that the circle must be around the alpha when we compare it to zero. OK, what about this one? That is the second choice. Alpha cannot be bigger than one. That's kind of obvious, isn't it? If alpha, if alpha is bigger than one, it means, it means that one of the newspapers takes more than 100% of the market. That's not possible. The maximum is 100%. What about alpha equal to 1, then? Is, does that seem reasonable? If alpha equals 1 here, then we get a 1 here. 1 minus 1, we get 0 there. The same here. That is not kind of meaningful here. Because in that case, one newspaper, in that case newspaper 1, have actually get gotten rid of newspaper 2, because they get the whole market in a sense, at least if they had the same case. So it seems reasonable to assume here these kind of link. So alpha must be, so actually it, let's see what it looks like in the text here. Maybe it was given. It was given, yeah, you see, it was given here as possibly equal to 1. But now I want to rule out this one. I'm taking this one out now logically. Okay, So I'm able to make a decision here and say that alpha must be smaller than 1. So I get circular on that one as well. <coughs> so our assumptions and given in the text now says the following a half is less than alpha is less than one. This is kind of what we build on when we continue finding the best replies here. If you look at 
this one, which is the next one to compare, looking for best replies. And again, look at this one. As long as alpha is bigger than a half, of course, this number is positive, isn't it? You subtract something which is a half and bigger. The only problem point here is if, if alpha equals 1. In that case, this is 0 and 0 equals 0. But we have assumed that alpha is less than 1 here. And of, as a consequence, of course, this one gets the square. Given this information, this number must always be larger than 0. You can never get 0 as the bottom point here, due to the fact that alpha is assumed to be strictly less than 1. In that case, we get 1 minus something, which is not 1, but still positive. <coughs> In this case, as long as alpha is bigger than a half, we subtract something, which makes this number less than 1. 1 minus something, okay, that is smaller than 1. And as long as, yeah, it doesn't really matter, as long as alpha is bigger than a half, it will always be a square around this one. So this number will be smaller than that one. In some cases, when we do these kind of tricks, we, don't, we are not kind of able to put these circles on the right spot. And in that case, we get a kind of a tree here, so we have to look, okay, suppose this happens, then we can find our shape. What about if other things happen? So th that is also a way of doing this, which sometimes may be sensible. But the conclusion from the analysis is straightforward here. There is a single Nash equilibrium here. It's this point, and it corresponds with the example we looked at in the textbook. You remember there were two newspapers that ended up putting the big revolutionary news uh, case on the front page. And that is also what happens here. So uh, Nash equilibrium, uh, we can sometimes write it like this. That means that we kind of pinpoint the strategic choices, in this case, big A, big A, as the solution. That is a normal way of writing it. OK. Questions? No questions. Then we move to sub question D. Does it make any difference for the newspapers if information on which choice the opponent has made on the first page story is revealed before the choice of first page story is made for the other newspaper? State reasons for your answers. So in question D here, we can now allow for espionage, okay? We'll make it possible for each of these guys to have a spy at the other desk. So that the spy can look at the newspaper story and communicate it to the competing newspaper so they can know it before they make their decision. So we can now open up for transforming this simultaneous game <coughs> into a <coughs> sequential game. And we're asked to judge whether that makes any difference. Of course, the only way of doing that is to actually analyze it. Okay, So we have to analyze this game actually in two situations as a sequential game. So we have to look at two different sequential games. One, where newspaper one makes the first decision, kind of reveals to the other one. The other, the other uh, example or the other instance the other way around, where it's newspaper 2 that makes the de first decision. So, <coughs> let's draw up uh, uh, two game trees here. So, either paper 1, I just put the P1 now, means paper 1. They make the decision whether to choose news case A or B, and then now suddenly newspaper 2 are able to observe that before they make their decision. Okay? Of course, they also decide what to take A or B, A or B. And this is, should we say, the first case. Alternatively, we could turn it around, making P2 the first 
one to announce again a b then it's p1 here p1 here like this a b a b okay so we have put up the two different game trees and of course we have to maybe we should draw a line here something like that and then we should look into some payoffs here so if this is the first newspaper this is the second newspaper if we go along this axis both choose a if both choose a newspaper one gets alpha newspaper two gets one minus alpha if we go to the bottom here both along b then we're down here the same thing happens like this if we if paper one chooses a paper two chooses b then we're over here aren't we one a two b one gets one and two gets zero in that one the only remaining is this one and then this zero and one changes place a similar argument for this second case um, yeah I don't think I, I, I need to put that numbers in okay you can see it in the solution yourself so let ju let's just look at this first one so the second one is kind of given for you to read yourself okay then we have to remember how to analyze sequential games by moving through these game trees backwards and to the front so we start at the end here and uh, paper 2 should make a decision here whether to choose news case A or news case B if they choose A they get 1 minus alpha if they choose B they get 0 you can see here that 1 minus alpha is assumed bigger than 0 so we end up by choosing this one don't we that one is bigger than that one moving down here A produces 1 B produces 1 minus alpha 1 is bigger than 1 minus alpha we can see it there so then we end up with A here as well this is what we have referred to as a dominant strategy isn't it you do the same no matter what the opponent do then we move to the first stage paper 1 can choose A and of course paper 2 chooses A here so it ends up here then paper 1 getting this alpha here alternatively gets down here uh, and then he gets this zero alpha is bigger than zero as it's bigger than a half isn't it so we end up with this one <coughs> uh, just a moment was I did I do something wrong now let me repeat my argument okay a alpha yeah alpha is bigger than zero so it's this one that should be correct so did it have any effect to have a, a spy in the other newspaper no the solution didn't change did it we got a a as the Nash equilibrium in the simultaneous game but we also got a a as the Nash equilibrium in the sequential game so there were no value in espionage here in this case the same thing happens if you do it the other way around you get the same kind of solution again so it doesn't matter there is no value in havi having a spy here does this example tell us that there never is value of having a spy what do you think about that that would be some kind of revolutionary thing to show, wouldn't it? Because we know there is a lot of spies, okay? So why do you have a lot of spies if there is no value? That doesn't seem logical. Obviously, the situation is important here. In this case, the strategies and the payoffs didn't pay off when it comes to espionage, but in other games, it may very well be. Remember the example we looked at in the first part of this course when we looked at this American-Japan competition on this high definition TV in that case it paid off okay it was sensible for the Americans to actually announce their 
decision and they kind of got out with a big bigger payoff. In this case, not. So, do you see any interesting espionage situations in football? What kind of information do a football team reluctantly give away before a match? Starting lineup. Starting lineup. Very good, Christian. Uh, not everybody, but uh, some. Okay. In the old days, this was kind of not so much. And I remember Egil Olsen in his first period, he always gave the lineup to all the opponents immediately without any fuss. But of course, these days, it seems like the value of espionage has increased here because uh, most coaches are reluctant giving up their lineup to the opponent. There are two situations where this espionage is of no value. Either if one of the teams is so much better than the other that it, that it, that it doesn't matter, or meaning that the squad is so good that it doesn't matter which players you use. And in some cases we see that. The other way around, of course, means the same. If one is very bad, much, much <laughs> less good than the other, of course, the same argument holds. But if they're kind of more equal in quality, it could be that knowledge of your opponent's lineup may affect your lineup. Okay. And of course, as you know, in most football matches, you can only substitute three players. And that could be a little bit too less. And if you have to do it immediately, then you don't have them in the end, and so on. Okay, so there is. There is a certain logic in uh, trying to avoid announcing your lineup to your opponent team. At least you can't lose on it, can you? I don't think so. Any other situations that espionage could be interesting in football? Now I'm testing your creativity. Christian has made his uh, point. He doesn't have to answer this one. Now it's the rest of you. Any other situations in football? This is kind of like uh, putting odds on uh, matches, isn't it? You need some information to do that. What kind of information are these odds setters interesting, interested in? What about injuries? Is could that be interesting? What about players' form? What about football players' relations to their girlfriends? Is, is this kind of information that could affect their ability to play and to play good in the match? Yes, of course it is. So this kind of information is to some extent similar to the lineup information. It's kind of up front of the lineup, kind of before the lineup comes. It kind of affects the actual lineup. What else is there? Again, slightly related to the lineup, but not necessarily the lineup. Of course, the, stra the strategic choices the coach makes and how to play. Okay, what kind of strategy should we start with? How should we respond to a goal against and that kind of stuff? Okay, to some extent, you you may see that by the lineup choices. So, did any of you watch Molde yesterday play against Strømskutse? Nobody. Aren't you interested in football? Did you see any matches at all? Brom? And you're happy then? Oh, you're not a Brom uh, fan. I didn't hear you? A little bit of a fan. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So you, you were hoping for Sondal then? No. No? <laughs> nice. Okay, I see. Yeah, it seems like it will be a qualifying match now between Brom and Christian Sun. That would be nice. Then you must go to Christian Sun and watch the match. At least I will do that. Okay, it's time for a break, I think. Yes, let's take a break.